Welcome to the Productive Life Podcast. In this episode, we're talking with Michelle Lewis of Visibility Vixen all about her celebrity CEO method and how you can execute 90-day sprints to increase your visibility. Welcome to the Productive Life Podcast hosted by me, Megan Mins. This is the podcast for entrepreneurs who want to be more productive in their business and their personal life. Because as a business owner, your business and personal life are connected, and we can't talk about one without talking about the other. Each week, you'll learn about productivity, organization, personal development, self-care, business strategies, and more. And now, let's get started. I am so excited to be talking with Michelle on today's podcast because she and I have been friends for a while on the internet now, and we have been trying to schedule an interview for a little bit, and I'm just so glad that we were finally able to make this happen. Michelle used to work in Hollywood and is an expert on how you can be more visible online in your business, and this interview was really, really helpful and insightful. And I honestly took like two pages of notes because I thought it was so actionable as well. So if you are looking to increase your visibility in your business, you don't want to miss this episode. Again, I'm so excited for Michelle to be here. So let's go ahead and jump in and get started now. Hey, Michelle, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so excited to kind of introduce you to my community. Megan, I'm thrilled to be here. I feel like this has been a long time coming and you know I adore you and we've kind of been in each other's circles for a couple of years now. I know. It's finally time that we're having this conversation and I cannot wait. I would love for you to just kick us off by just sharing a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what your business is about. Absolutely. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast today. I am so excited to be here chatting with Megan. My name is Michelle Lewis. I run a business called Visibility Vixen, and I specialize in helping online entrepreneurs transition from the CEO role to the celebrity in their niche. So we're going to be talking about that today. And just on a personal note, I own a pug. His name is Oliver. He's up in Idaho. I miss him so much. So I'm having pug withdrawals. Oh, pug withdrawals. That's so real. (laughs) Dog withdrawals. I'm so, I'm sorry that you don't have your pug with you right now. That's so, I am spirit. Yes. I have two multi poos and they're just at daycare right now so that they wouldn't bark. And even that, I just miss their small little presence in my life. So I I know they're just too far away. We, We work online. Like we're at home. We need our dogs. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will keep the pug in spirit throughout this interview. So I'm really excited, not only for what you do, specializing in visibility and this entire concept of going from like CEO to celebrity in your niche. So I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes. But one thing I know that you teach about and you talk about is this idea of like 90 day sprints and how you can use them with the intention of becoming more visible. So tell me a little bit about what that actually means. Absolutely. So it's something that I like to call the celebrity CEO method. And it's what I have not, I'm not going to say I'm absolutely perfect at this, but I aspire to be. I love finding systems. And I think that's why you and I get along so well. How can I simplify something? How can I know exactly what I need to do? And for my personal personality, I want to put it into my like Asana or click up and organize it, do all the work ahead of time, and then never have to think about it again. So you're speaking my love language. Excellent. So that's what I love to do. And so I was trying to figure out while I was podcast guesting and hosting and summits and video and Facebook and Instagram, I was going insane. And I was spending so much time in the visibility of my business that I, I didn't have time to really focus on revenue and publicity and all the other things that I wanted. So I decided to come up with a system called the Celebrity CEO Method. And that's where you really sit down and figure out, okay, based on your unique personality type, what are your natural visibility strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then start taking your visibility vehicle, whether it's Instagram, Facebook groups, whatever, one at a time and focusing just on that for 90 days, perfecting that process, and then ultimately outsourcing as much of it as you can. And then, you know, doing a little bit of keep up, but giving yourself the room and space to then bring on the next vehicle, the next vehicle over the next couple of quarters. So when I did that in my business, I saw a huge difference in not only how I felt, but the results I was getting. So now that's what I teach to my students. Wow. I am so excited to be talking about this because I feel like this (laughs) is something that not only have I struggled with before, a lot of the clients that I work with struggle with this idea of there's so many things to do, so many places to be. How do you 
do that. And usually it's like, oh, just pick one thing and focus on it. But I love this idea of you don't have to pick this one thing and only ever do it forever. You can kind of systemize it one one vehicle, as you say, at a time. So that's super interesting. How did you, when you did this, I guess, what vehicle did you choose to work on first and how did you pick it? I picked, let me see, what did I do at the time? I did podcast hosting. That was my first one that I tested this system on. Um, and I had season one under my belt. And as I stepped into season two, I knew how much bandwidth a podcast was going to take. As you know, it's a ton of work. And mine was also on YouTube and clips on Facebook and Instagram and blah, blah, blah. It was just so overwhelming. So I actually brought on a team to help me get the process done. So I actually was able to batch record my entire season in like two weeks. And it was a weekly show. And then my team handled everything else while I focused on, you know, working in my membership or in my group program or on, you know, the other things that I wanted to do so that I could then sustain bringing on a new vehicle. And I think that was Instagram and Summit hosting at the time. Wow. That's amazing. And I love the idea that you did a whole season in two weeks. That's pretty inspiring. And I love that you ended up hiring out the like post recording piece of the puzzle. Cause I think that's huge for all podcasters, whether you're batching or not. So if someone wanted to get started doing this, this idea sounds really appealing to them. Where do they start? Do they just pick a, whatever vehicle they think they should choose? Like, how do you recommend people get started using this method? I definitely recommend, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. I do have a quiz that helps with this, but you need to figure out what is your zone of genius. So like in my quiz, you're either a director, actor, writer, or production designer. So for example, Megan is a production designer. She thrives on processes and building empires and streamlining and productivity. So she's going to have a different zone of genius than let's say a uh, actor whose personality is much more in front of the camera and bubbly and go with the flow and totally freedom based. So I think the first step is figure out your unique strengths because that's going to really narrow down the visibility vehicles you choose and then pick one, outline all of those tasks that you need for that one visibility vehicle. So let's say you are going to host an online summit, right? That's a beast of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's one of the hardest ones that you can do, but it can be one of the most rewarding. So sitting down in your project management software, planning the whole thing out down to every single task and then executing it in that 90-day sprint to be able to look back on it and go, what's working? And I do this every 30 days. What's working? What's not? What's my profit? What are my analytics? Is this something that I'm really enjoying doing? Because it also, you need to be able to enjoy it and then figuring out, okay, what pieces of this can I outsource so that I can then move on to the next vehicle? Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm actually taking notes while you're talking. <laughs> Ooh, I I'm love like, that. I'm like, how do I, <laughs> how do, I do this? Um, so if you hear me writing, that's why. That's a really unique. So go ahead and tell everyone where they can find this quiz. Cause I feel like if anyone's listening to this, they're probably already ready to be like, pause, let me go find out what I am. Yeah, for sure. So it's just visibilityvixen.com forward slash take the quiz. Okay. It's really quick, super easy. And then you're actually going to go into a free masterclass, depending on your result, where we will break down your strengths and weaknesses and what possible visibility vehicles will be in your zone right after you take it. Mm, I love this. What are some, I, you kind of mentioned that a summit is a more difficult visibi visibility vehicle. It's not impossible, mm -hmm. but it's a bigger project, a bigger undertaking. What are some of the vehicles you typically recommend that maybe someone who isn't really creating anything consistently right now, and maybe this would be a new vehicle for them to start? Is Are there a few that you typically recommend that you know people might consider first? I actually recommend starting with zero vehicles. And I know I'm going to sound Ooh. crazy, but hear me out. I think the first thing that's really important is to dig into your brand and how you come across to an audience. So figuring out what does my uh, primary brand color, what does that communicate? Okay, is my content shaped around this? My photo shoot, do you have a brand video? That's the best place to get started because then I recommend moving into the stage for your first visibility vehicle where you're actually guesting. That can be on people's podcasts, live streaming shows, summits. This is a way for you to 
you know, shine for the expert that you are, but capitalize on someone else's audience instead of trying to work on not only producing like a summit or a podcast, which is so much work, and you're trying to build it from the ground up to build up an audience. Instead, first focus on the guesting so that you can get your revenue stream under control, get your message really crystallized to then start with your own like leading role of having your own show. So that's my recommendation. Definitely wasn't what I expected, but I like that concept a <laughs> I lot because I think it's a little bit weird. No, it, it makes perfect sense when you explain it because I think as I work with clients, a lot of people, when maybe they haven't created a lot of consistent content themselves yet, they can feel like they quote unquote aren't ready to be on someone else's podcast or like they haven't, or I don't know, I think there's this perception that being someone else's guest is like this higher level than like creating your own stuff. Do you ever feel like you work people through that mindset issue or have you ever encountered that before? Absolutely. And I think that confusion and that lack of, for lack of a better term, confidence is because there is no clarity. When you have the clarity of exactly who you are, what your message is, your mini bios down, you know exactly how you help your customer. Then when you start guesting, you're really working on your confidence. That's the muscle that you're flexing. And if you can communicate clearly and you know, Every time that we record, we're trying to get better and better with our personality. It's hard. Like when we're sitting down like you and I are right now, Megan, it's easy to just relax and let your voice sound more like this and not have a lot of inflection. So we are building those skills of being a really great guest. And I think then when we go to get on our own show, we have all of that work in place. So for example, like I have a Hollywood background. So I think about when you're auditioning, you don't go from like being a background extra to being a leading role in a show, right? You start as like a guest star and you come in and you do a couple lines, then you get a recurring role. Then you start auditioning for those lead roles. So it's the same kind of process just in the online world. Wow. And I feel like that's such a great way to explain it too, because it, again, it just isn't often explained that way in what we do, which is kind of funny that something like Hollywood, which has been around for a while, has this like standard expected cadence. But for some reason in the online world, we it's easy to kind of flip that somehow where you like have to be the lead before you can even be a guest or a guest star or something. So I think that's super interesting. And as a personal story here, I can totally relate to this lack of confidence in how by not having like a clear messaging or clarity on what you do can make this a little bit more difficult because I'll be super honest with you. Anyone who's my listener knows that I've been on quite a journey this year since starting the podcast. And I actually did an interview. I don't even think it's gone live yet. And I secretly hope it never will like, cause I'm a terrible person, which is a whole mindset thing. All the things I just said, ignore. Those are all ma- weird mindset things that I just said, getting very honest with you guys here. But I experienced my first interview um, after making the transition to being self-employed again. And I actually think it was either the first, I think it was the first week I was self-employed again is when I recorded this. And I was still figuring out a lot of stuff. And I did this interview and the very first thing where it was like, tell us about yourself. And I was like, I totally, I said stuff, but I don't feel like I said anything that I actually felt was significant or that really resonated with me. And I felt like I know the interview itself has good quality in it, but I didn't feel confident in what my purpose was, what, why I was there, what I was bringing to the table. And it really rocked the boat for me in a way that was like, Ooh, okay. That was kind of weird to like, not have that clarity or confidence in myself and how it affected the entire experience for me. And I don't, again, I don't even think that other, the other host seemed to have a good time. You know, she was great, but I think it's kind of funny how this mindset talk of like, I don't know enough, I'm not good enough, what, you know, what is my purpose can really play a role, even when you're just trying to get started and like being a guest on someone else's show. So I totally agree with the importance of figuring that out. And I think it can honestly sound a little intimidating though, to try to figure that out. Like, oh, what is a brand video? I don't even know really what I'm doing yet. You know, so how do you, how do you teach people to kind of take those things that might seem intimidating to someone getting started and make them more accessible or like easier to do at the very beginning. 
Well, that's what's so interesting, especially if I get on, let's say, like a discovery call with someone that really wants to join my lounge. And I ask them like, okay, tell me a little bit about what what you do. And they're super confident. They're like, oh, I do this and this. And I'm, you know, let's say I'm a life coach and I teach my one-on-one clients and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just ready to have my work be more visible. I'm like, fantastic. And things are going great. Then they join the lounge and they start going through the star mapping system, which is all this branding stuff we're talking about. And then the brand video. And they're like, what? Like, how am I going to put this together? Like, this is so stressful. I'm like, no, no, no. The only reason why it's stressful is because you're getting to the space of having people see you in this visible area where you actually have to verbalize and communicate exactly what you're doing and the path that you're taking someone down. It's like, for example, it's a totally different bear. Like a friend of mine, you might've heard of her. Her name is Jamie Jensen. She uh, talks all about brand story online, but she's also a screenwriter in real life. I had lunch with her the other day. So it's one thing to be the writer and to write the story. That's pre-production, right? Then you take it in, you break down the script, you get all the details hammered out. And this is where the script usually gets torn up a little bit, right? It's not practical. This needs to be shot in 60 days instead of 90, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go into actual production where you're shooting everything and trying to get that vision actually onto a, sc- onto a screen. Then you go into post-production with the editing to see that final product. There's so much transformation that that movie has to go through, right? And it must be absolutely exhausting for that screenwriter because they're like, my baby, we're the same exact way with our business. And so when you can go through this process and have the self-examination of understanding, oh, okay, I'm going to adjust my teleprompter script here and here, and this is what I want my audience to feel. This is the story that I want to communicate. And you put in all that work to this beautiful finished product, and then you put that up on your website so that when the traffic, when you're doing these guest posts or whatever comes in, and they're able to resonate with you and identify with you in one minute versus what 15 emails would take. It's just absolutely amazing what I've seen happen. And I find that when my student or an audience member gets that clarity, it changes everything. And their confidence level is just inevitable. Mm, I could totally see that because like I said, after having that experience myself, it was like, wow, okay, I really need to take a moment and figure out what I'm really doing here and how to communicate that. I think that's key that you talked about. We might know in our head what we're doing, but if you aren't used to explaining it to someone else, um, you can kind of get stuck on that. So I think this is Mm -hmm. a really unique process and I can totally see the value that going through a process like this provides. I do have a question that came up for me while you were talking is... yeah. Um, A lot of times once we start doing something, we might get clarity and tweak our messaging or tweak what we're doing or adjust our services or our products. Do you often find that people need to revisit the brand video or things like this often or the way you do it, it, it's like lasting through those tweaks? I think that we're always a work in process. I mean, my first brand video, and you can see it like right now on YouTube, that was from two years ago and I'm due for a revamp. I've done a lot since then. I've been on TEDx and I've done a lot of other cool opportunities that I want to put in there. And my message has changed a little bit. And that's the beauty of, you know, us running an online business is that it is going to morph and grow. And just as a side note, like with what Megan was saying about doing that podcast and feeling like it was a struggle, I think another great thing that you can do if you can step back and be a little bit more objective is go, how can I utilize this for lack of a better term, like failure or stumble into a teaching opportunity. So if I was Megan, I'd either make a blog post or I'd contact a podcaster friend of mine and say, hey, I have this interview that I did where I made these mistakes and I want to contrast that with now the podcast that I'm hosting and one of the episodes I felt really good about so that my audience can learn that it is a process and see the strengths and weaknesses I had in each and learn from themselves. Like that would be something that I think would be a really cool opportunity for Megan to do that would help other people go, oh, like it's not just me, right? Having that huge struggle and make her more relatable and more visible at the same time. So you can do a lot of cool stuff when you start looking at it objectively. Yep. Just made a note that I should talk about that story. Yeah. (laughs) 
I guess I just told it a little bit, but obviously even, even sharing that story with you, I don't know if you guys listening noticed, and it'll also depend on how good of a job my editor does at cleaning up that story. (laughs) But I mean, I didn't even explain the story very well. I suddenly got on a tangent of mindset issues, which is kind of funny. And I think it's just an example of getting more comfortable communicating, sharing your stories, sharing what you do and all of that is just so helpful. And I'm really glad that we're talking about this, Michelle. So, Me too. so we've, so we've ca- you know, you've explained the basic structure of how this works, the 90 day vehicle, how to pick your first one, starting with zero vehicles. Like what's the next step in this process? How do we, how do we keep using this to help our business? Absolutely. So once you have pretty much crystallized your brand, then you've been able to start guesting on other people's shows and summits, et cetera. Then I recommend stepping into that leading role. And that can be uh, with your own signature show, whether it's a live streaming show or a YouTube channel, a podcast, a summit, writing opinion pieces, whatever's going to put you more in the limelight. Because the intention is now that we've become a little bit more well-known doing these interviews, building building up our email list, building up our sales. Now we're ready to be seen as that expert in our niche. And that needs to be with the signature show, like what Megan's doing right now with this podcast. So I think that is the next step. You're not going to have as much of the struggle of trying to build an audience and get listeners because you've built that up in the guest star stage. So this is where we really want to step into our own signature show. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Um, Is there a certain... I'm getting nitty gritty with you. So you can tell me to just butt off if I need to, (laughs) but like, um, is there a certain length of time that you feel like people should be just in the guest stage or is it not really about how long it is, but more about how you're feeling about it? Like, do you have any parameters on how to know when you're ready to move on to your own vehicle? I think when you're feeling good about where your numbers are in terms of your sales, your list, your connection, wherever you're building up your audience um, outside of your email list, whether it's a Facebook group, Facebook page, Instagram, LinkedIn, where whatever it may be. Um, but usually my students are about three to six months in guest okay. star. Um, A lot of them come to me and they've already launched their podcast, but they're feeling so frustrated because their uh, listeners are not growing. Um, Of course, I've had students that come and literally their podcast just takes off because it's keyword rich and people love it, especially like in the mom niche. So that does happen, but that's more of a one in a million. Mm -hmm. Um, So my whole purpose is let's avoid the pain of that because then that starts crushing our confidence and our sense of, am I even doing this right? Should I even be doing this at all? So that's why I do recommend starting with the guest starring so that when you're stepping into launching your own show, you have that audience base built in, and then you can start snowballing that into more and more viewers or listeners. That makes perfect sense. Do you typically recommend, just like you were saying, if someone comes to you, they start this process, they really want to put an emphasis on, you know, being the guest, do you recommend they actually stop doing whatever their current show is? Or is it okay to kind of keep your current show rolling, but just leverage being a guest star and putting more emphasis on that to help grow your show? I think it really depends. Like, I don't think there's any shame hitting the pause button. And a lot of us feel like that would be a failure, but it's not. I put a pause button on my podcast from season two and it's not, it wasn't for a specific reason other than I was getting burnt out and I needed to focus on a couple of things in my business. And then I decided I wanted to release, you know, one or two seasons a year and not have it be a recurring show. So that was my strategy. But I do think if you're coming into this and you're feeling really burnt out and your numbers just aren't turning into leads or customers, then it's time to step back because I'm the kind of person that used to be very high achieving. Business was number one, high expectation, and it tore my body apart. And Mm -hmm. so I really had to sit back and go. At at the time, I could only work about 20 to 30 minutes a day. So my business could no longer be my life. And I think that's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Our business is not our life. It's something that we do, but health is number one. Family and friends is number two. And so whatever you're doing, if it's costing you too much in terms of your relationship with self or others, and you're not monetizing from it, then it might be time to just hit pause, step back, try a new strategy and one that uses, not uses, but benefits from someone else's audience to make sure that you're doing things correctly and getting those results that you've really been looking after usually for more than a year. 
Wow. I love that. And I completely resonate with all of that. I did something similar. I've definitely been on the burnout cycle before. I think it 2019, I think is the first year where I feel like I've for lack of a better word, broken the cycle, but I've Mm -hmm. had to make a lot of fundamental changes in the way I do things in order to do that. Otherwise I was just for years on this perpetual burnout hamster wheel. And I think so many people are, and don't know how to really make those shifts. Have you felt that like this way of approaching, you know, projects and visibility by having these 90 day sprints, by where you're focusing on, you know, one vehicle at a time, has that helped you kind of break the burnout cycle in your life and business? Or have there been other things too that have contributed? Just, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, of course. I think for me, I stopped consuming content. Yeah. Um, that was huge. And I'm not saying, I mean, stay listening to Megan's podcast, y'all. I'm <laughs> not okay. telling you. We're all about being healthy and so okay. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, I was I was just talking to someone about this yesterday. And I don't mean to offend anyone listening, but I was realizing how much I've been participating in almost the cult mentality of entrepreneurship. I think we get into this world and we become obsessed and we start listening to 20 podcasts and 50 newsletters and YouTube channels and courses and programs and masterminds and memberships and on and on we go. And it can be such a white noise that we forget what our initial purpose was. I think we're all um, given when we're born that special mission. And some of us have that beautiful mission online. Isn't that incredible? But we spend so much time ingesting content and looking around and comparing ourselves to what's going on and trying to stay relevant and in that high energy that we burn out. So for me, it's just been very strategic to step back prioritize the health and do these 90 day sprints so that I'm still getting the results. I'm still growing, but I'm doing it in a way that isn't as panicked. It isn't as forced. And I'm listening to my own internal clock for lack of a better term, instead of looking at what everyone else is telling me to do. And I found more success in that. And my students have as well. Oh, wow. I feel like there's so many things that we could talk about. I have so many thoughts on everything (laughs) you just shared because I feel like I've done the same thing before where I have to be really intentional about content consumption. I think especially when I'm in a phase of building or creating, like when I Mm -hmm. need to be really tuned into my own intuition and my own gut instincts and my own thoughts and feelings and actions. I think when we consume too much, those things become like dulled over or muted. And it's really hard to listen to your own self when you're just used to looking externally for like the answers or information or next steps or validation. And so I have totally done the same thing and I recommend it too. So like, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to do the thing you're not supposed to, but like, if you (laughs) are listening to this episode and you are in this state where you're just consuming too much content. Like I love you, but like maybe stop listening to podcasts for like a couple weeks. Like the content will always be there for you to come back and take a break and just focus on learning how to even hear your own voice. Because I, for the longest time said, I'm not intuitive. That's what I like to call this concept of like your own gut thoughts. Um, what did you call it? You, you didn't say intuition. I put that word in your mouth, but, um, your own thoughts and feelings and intentions and purpose. And I've like, I think you have to just take a step back and really learn to listen to yourself. And now here I am like all about intuition and, you know, living your life in a more intuitive way where you have frameworks and structures and concepts like the sprints to give you this foundation and a structure and a boundary, but learning how to like, listen to yourself when it comes to actually following through and taking action and making decisions. So again, I could go on like a whole tangent there, but to I think you said that beautifully. Well, thank you. Um, I just, it totally resonates with me. And I think one thing I actually want to take like two steps back to something you said earlier that I think is really interesting and the opposite of what a lot of people do. Um, And you were talking about how when you're starting with zero vehicles and your guest, your guest star on other people's vehicles, and when it's time to move on and start your own show, you said when you know it's time, when you're feeling good about your sales, you listed a few other things too, but I, I thought it was an interesting point that you 
to just clarify with anyone listening that you are selling while you're guest starring that Mm -hmm. one year when you're in this guest star phase, that doesn't mean you don't have products to sell or services to sell, or you aren't growing your email list. The whole point of the guest star is to start making money, selling your own products and building your own community in whatever medium you decide to do that. Right. Did I explain that well, or is there anything else you want to emphasize on making sure they know to sell while they're in the guest star phase? You explained it perfectly. And the problem here that a lot of people fall into, I just met with an entrepreneur yesterday at, a, at the coffee shop and she was so excited. She's a one-on-one coach and she was like, I'm going to put my information into a course because that way it's going to be, it's going to be lower ticket. It's going to be much easier to sell. And I was like, okay, wait, 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 wait. You've probably been hearing from people that are saying, make an online course, make an online course, not saying that's wrong, but how are you going to market it? And she's like, well, well, what do you mean? Like, I'm just, you know, going to promote it and da, da, da. I say, yeah, but where and how, and what's the strategy? I say, you're going to put all of these hours into creating this online course, this new product when you're not consistently selling your one-on-one now. So that has nothing to do with you and what you're worth. You're worth everything. And I want you to do everything that you want to do, but let's first make sure that you have a funnel that's fully functional. So instead of creating that and then worrying about the marketing, let's worry about the marketing now and start getting you on podcasts and summits to start getting more traffic, more of an email list and seeing if your funnel works before you put energy into completely changing up your program. So that's just one example. And I think that's a huge energy saver because what you can do is let's say you've guested on three podcasts and you know that one has, I don't know, 5,000 downloads, one has 20,000, one has 50,000. So you're going, okay, I'm going to get a certain amount of traffic. If after the month they've all aired, you haven't made one sale, but you can look at your funnels and you know people are going through them, then it's time to adjust stuff until you do start seeing those results. Because then you're going to know that it converts to be able to, when you launch your own show, have that process perfected so you're not having to worry about the nuts and bolts when you move on to launching your own show. Mm, That makes so much sense. And I feel like that example really like made it click for me and, and how you can explain it because it's kind of the, I don't want to say it's the opposite, but like a lot of times when we're thinking of creating a course and marketing it or really marketing anything like course service, whatever it is, a lot of times we think about how to market it organically first. And this guest process is organic, but it's Mm -hmm. looking outside of your own immediate nucleus and looking outside that. Because a lot of times when I'm working with clients who maybe do services like coaching and they're really dependent on booking discovery calls, like they need to get discovery calls booked as like the entrance point for them, for the way their business is set up. And a lot of times it's like, well, how do I get more? Do you have any ideas? And it's like, well, this is a great path to go. Like keep doing what you're doing to nurture nurture the people already in your bubble, but by stepping out of your own network and being a part of someone else's existing audience, that reach is just huge. So whether it's a service or a course or a discovery call or an application, you know, the key is that we're tapping into a bigger audience and exposing you and introducing you to that bigger audience. Exactly. Because the other thing that you're doing with these application processes, getting on is for the example we're using today, podcast guesting, you're also having to build relationships. You're having to pitch, build relationships, perform, and, you know, ultimately monetize. And so if you think that that process is not going to be applicable down the road, when you're applying to TEDx, getting on stages, writing opinion pieces, getting featured, like it's all related. So this is, a beautiful training ground that you can utilize knowing that it's going to serve you forever because it's always great to be podcast guesting, but it's also going to help you very strategically when you're ready to step into more of that celebrity role and book much bigger things. Mm, I love that. So at a high level, you figure out where your zone of genius is. Then you start with zero vehicles and start being a guest star on other people's existing shows and platforms. Mm -hmm. And when you're ready, usually three to six months, or you're feeling really good about your numbers, you create your own show, your own signature show, whatever medium or vehicle that is. You spend the next 90 days really nurturing and growing that vehicle. And then is it within the 90 days that you try to um, delegate and hire and systemize, or do you kind of bring that into the net? How does that work? Does that, is that within the 90 days? 
You can do it within the 90 days. I recommend as much of it as you can do yourself because you're really honing in on your process, especially the first 30 and then the first 60 days. The ultimate goal is complete the first sprint, the first quarter, then look at it. Am I going to stick with this vehicle? Was it a success? Was it a failure? Do I want to keep going? And if you want to keep going, then it's time to figure out what task can you outsource with the goal of you only keeping 5 to 10% of the responsibility so you have the bandwidth to then move on to the next vehicle. So this is how you can keep podcast guesting. Let's say you're applying for uh, three months and that has built up your revenue enough where you can outsource the application process. But remember, you're going to be able to tell that person, this is exactly how I want you to pitch me. I get stale pitches from people all the time. I'm sure you do too, because they've just hired someone and the person does the same standard pitch. So you're able to be very, very specific with that person. So they're applying for you in the right way. And then you have the bandwidth to go, okay, now I'm going to host my first online summit because that's taken care of. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I would love to hear from you. Where are you now? Like how many vehicles do you have in play right now in your business? I'm trying to think here. Um, I am doing public speaking. I released my first book last summer. I've got about three going on right now. So I'm not doing like a ridiculous amount, uh, but I've kind of transitioned to doing more stages and stuff now, which has been really, really fun while still maintaining the ones online and social media and uh, Pinterest as well. Okay. That's that's really inspiring because I feel like those are a lot of things that people want to be doing. And I guess that's part of your method of how you become kind of that celebrity in your niche is by going through this process. And eventually you can be where you are, where you're in this little bit more of a celebrity stage of your business, which I think is really unique and cool and what everyone wants. So I have a bit of a logistical question though, because I'm wondering, you, you're doing a lot. Mm-hmm. How big is your team? My team is ridiculously small, Megan. Oh, <laughs> tell me, tell me. Um, I honestly, I moved all my systems to one system. Uh, I mean, I have another one for social media, but like my websites, my funnels, my webinars, my membership, my program is all in one system. And that has saved me so much time and manpower. So right now I have one person. Um, well, no, I'm lying. I have two. Um, the first one runs the visibility lounge. So she does the emails and, you know, the posts and the logistical side. So I can just show up and support the students and record new trainings. And then I just brought on uh, a full-time Pinterest manager. So just because I was sick of doing that myself um, and I wanted to be able to outsource that to someone who knew more than me. So that's what I've got going on right now. That is a much smaller team than I thought Mm. you were about to tell Mm -hmm. me, which I think is very interesting. It's very small. What system? You said you have one system now. You mean like an actual tech platform that you're using for everything? Yes. What yes. is it? Tell me. I use secrets. Kajabi. Oh, I was wondering if you're going to say ClickFunnels or Kajabi. I didn't know. I have been through, I mean, I started with WordPress, then moved to Squarespace, then moved to Teachable, then ClickFunnels, and now Kajabi. So I have tried it all. And each platform has its pros and cons. Uh, this was just a platform that I really enjoyed that has been growing with me and um, has just been able to do everything I want it to do. So it's been life-changing for my business personally. That's so interesting. I'm not sure. I haven't really given Kajabi a hard look in a little while. And I didn't know some of the things you listed out. I didn't know Kajabi did like Mm -hmm. webinars and funnels and stuff. Like did not know Kajabi did anything with that. They do. And I just moved over my email list two weeks ago. Whoa. Um, you really are like everything on that one platform. No, it's been incredible. Uh, just for what I need. I mean, I really sat down. I got into the hype of like, oh, big team and this and that. And then I went, wait a second, like what's going to work for me? I don't mind being a little bit more behind the scenes and working in my business to make sure everything's set up the way I want it to. I then want to be able to outsource the everyday running of it. So So those are the things that I have outsourced. But other than that, I'm really happy just having it be me in my apartment with my pug and going out and booking a stage whenever I want to. But it's just been really, really great to zone in on what would be best for me in running my business. So I think that's an important distinction. Yeah. I love that. That is such a great distinction. So just a few little last minute, not last minute, we got plenty of time, but a little, (laughs) little bit more like logistical productivity questions. Like now that I fully understand this framework, because I think it's... Mm -hmm. 
beautiful in the way that it is simple, but effective and allows you to stay really focused, which I think so many of us struggle with staying focused and staying on track and not getting shiny object syndrome. So now that we're kind of in the, in the weeds of what a business run like this kind of looks like, how many, like, this is a nitty gritty, but like how many hours are you working? Like considering how small your team is and how much you're doing, are you feel like, do you feel like you're working 40 hours a week, more, less? I'd love to hear. Yeah. So that fluctuates because I am right now recording the trainings for the group program that I just launched a couple weeks ago. So of course the workload's more. I'm writing out scripts, uh, using the teleprompter, recording videos, editing. So my workload has increased exponentially and it will for the next two weeks until I finish that content. Besides that, I would say I'm working about three to four hours a day, four to five days a week. Awesome. So it's very manageable. Yeah. I like that. That, I think that's just really, hopefully for people listening, that can just be inspirational that you can still be, you know, this visible, you can be doing this much and you don't have, like, you don't have to work harder, work all the time to achieve that when you're using smart systems and smart frameworks to help you be more productive and stay on track. So I think that's really, really inspirational. And it makes me feel really excited about the parts of this that I might incorporate into my business too, because I have big dreams and big visions of where I want to go. And sometimes it's just like, okay, how do we, how we want to get there without, you know, getting back to that burnout cycle. So I think this is really exciting for me. So I feel like you've given us so much for free already just on this episode. (laughs) So thank you so much for how open and honest and, you know, helpful you've been with your process and how we can kind of work in the same framework. So I'd love to just know like, where can people find you and what you have some bonuses? You mentioned the quiz. Is there anything else you would like for our listeners to go, go grab and learn more about you in this process? Absolutely. Like we mentioned, if you want to find your unique personality type Hollywood style, you can take the quiz. That's just visibilityvixen.com forward slash take the quiz. And we'll also link um, my color class below in case you want to know more about the psychology of color. Happy to provide that. Um, those are two of my absolute favorites. So I think that people will really enjoy that. Okay, perfect. And then where can everyone go to just find out more about you? Where do you want them to listen to you or follow you or watch you? Yeah, just come on over to Visibility Vixen. That's my website. Those are my social media handles. I would love, love, love if you shouted us out on Instagram. Be sure to tag Megan. Be sure to rate her podcast five stars. That's what gets her podcast more visible on like iTunes and Spotify. So if you have just a couple of seconds today, set those aside to shout us out and give her some love. Thank you. Can I have you just do the outro for all of my podcasts? Because that yeah, would be I'm lovely. Ready. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. After that, I'll have you record it and I'll just splice that at the end because it's you say that so lovely. So thank you for Perfect. saying that. And thank you again for just so much, your time, your knowledge, your expertise. And I, I got so much out of this. So I know our listeners did too. So thank you so much. Absolutely. You know, I adore you, Megan. I love what you're doing. I love your heart. And it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Michelle and got as much out of it as I did. And like Michelle said, if you did enjoy it, I would love for you to share on Instagram stories and be sure to tag Michelle and I so that we can see it and share with our communities too. Thank you again. And I will see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Productive Life Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, it would mean so much to me if you would share your biggest takeaway on your Instagram stories or wherever you hang out. This helps me understand what you find the most helpful so that I can make more episodes and resources like this. If this podcast has helped you at all, please take just one minute to leave a review on iTunes so that we can help spread the word about the Productive Life Podcast with others who may enjoy it. And last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get the latest episodes sent to you directly. To learn how to work with me one-on-one or get instant access to freebies, trainings, templates, workshops, and more, be sure to go to meganmins.com right now. I'll see you in the next episode.